It is my pleasure to now welcome and introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Anil Seth. Dr. Seth is a professor of cognitive and computational neuroscience at the University of Sussex in the UK and founding direct co-director of the Sackler Center for Consciousness Science. He's also co-director of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research on Brain, Mind and Consciousness, editor in chief of the academic journal, Neuroscience of Consciousness and a Welcome Trust Engagement Fellow. In his work, he seeks to understand the biological basis of consciousness by bringing together research across neuroscience, mathematics, AI, computer science, psychology, philosophy, psychiatry, and other fields. His research has important practical applications, driving novel clinical approaches to psychiatric disorders, as well as innovative approaches to machine learning and brain-inspired technologies. You may have also seen his popular TED talk on how your brain hallucinates your conscious reality. Dr. Seth presented at our symposium in San Francisco last year, and he provided valuable and actionable insight into the neuroscience behind why change can be so difficult due to the differences between human perception and reality. This year, he will provide an update on his research and dive more into the topic of why do we make the choices we make, the neuroscience of, of voluntary action and decision-making. The topic has obvious implications for us in the engineering and construction industry and as project delivery leaders and teams. Now, as this is an interactive session, please type any questions you may have for Dr. Seth into the question box during his presentation. We'll allow about 15 minutes at the end of his session to um, answer some of those questions. And with that, let's welcome Dr. Anil Seth. Dr. Seth, over to you. Thank you very much. Just trying to start the video here. And oops. Okay, start video and share my screen. Excuse me for a second. Almost ready. Okay. I hope that's all working. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and, and uh, thank you, uh, Gary, for that very interesting uh, update from your side. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be back. So good morning and good afternoon and good evening uh, to everyone. Um, yeah, so uh, as, a, as Kristen said, I was, I was lucky to be able to talk at the previous year's uh, symposium. And I'm not going to repeat exactly the same thing today, but I do want to emphasize for those people if you didn't see me there last year is that I'm not a project manager, I'm not an engineer. So I am, I am a neuroscientist interested in consciousness and perception. And I kind of see my role and opportunity here as more of a, a provocateur. I want to try and give you some news from the, from the lands of, of neuroscience and cognitive science that I hope will make you or allow you to think uh, differently about what you do. And, and we can talk about that in, in the Q&A as well. So I'm fundamentally interested, since we don't get the chance to hang out in person, I just will tell you two minutes about you know, what really drives me. I'm fundamentally interested in this mystery of consciousness. And it's one of the oldest questions uh, in philosophy and science. People have wondered about it since they've been wondering about anything. Why is there something it is like to be you? What does it mean uh, to be you? How does this mess of electrified pate inside your skull generate any kind of conscious experience? Um, and of course, conscious experiences, are, you know, we have experiences of making decisions, we have experiences of, of doing things, and, and this is perhaps where the, the relevance, what I will tell you today, comes in. But I'm interested in this question about consciousness theoretically, I'm interested how to investigate it experimentally, and how to make use of it practically, too. So before I jump into the topic of decision making, I just wanted to give you a quick sense of the kind of thing that I do. What, what do we do in a lab that, that researches consciousness? Well, it ranges across many different disciplines. So we, we're involved in philosophy. I write philosophy papers uh, that try to get a better handle on the conceptual issues about what do we mean by consciousness and perception. Um, but philosophy, as I've discovered, is, is wonderful for asking questions, but it's really terrible at answering those questions. So the majority of what we do 
is working in understanding the nuts and bolts of perception. How do brains transform this stream of sensory data that we swim in, that our brains swim in all the time, into this coherent world of people, objects, and places? And how does that differ between different people too? And we build computational models and test them in, uh, in experiments. That's what I talked about a lot last year. We do brain imaging, we look inside living human brain to see what's going on when people uh, perceive things and make choices. And interestingly, some of the main work we do here is in developing novel statistical methods that have applicability way outside neuroscience. For instance, we're super interested in, in developing methods for measuring causality and information flow complex systems. And then finally, and recently, we've become much more interested in machine learning and AI. Of course, this is a big, uh, a big topic. We heard about it last year from Alex Rubel-Kava. Uh, and I'm very interested, and we're working on how to enhance machine learning algorithms by making them more brain-like, uh, particular, for instance, algorithms that choose what data they learn from. Now, today, I'm going to focus on just one small aspect of all this, which is why do we make the choices that we make? And this is, this is a reasonable question. This is a question about decision-making. But I'm also going to ask an unreasonable question, um, which is what on earth is free will? Now, this is the kind of question that gets you into trouble. When you start talking about free will, it's often very difficult to stop. Uh, but I'm gonna take the risk because if decision-making is anything, it's an expression of what we think whatever free will really is. And we make decisions of our own volition. And also I'm, I'm a safe distance away and part of my role is to be provocative and talking about free will is often that. But I'll start with a more tangible, simple example, I think. And this, this example is of how our decision-making can go awry. It comes from a very well-known book by Dan Ariely called Predictably Irrational the hidden forces that shape our decisions. And in this, in this example, he presents subscription options for the Economist magazine. And there were several from this website that, that he described. You could have a web only subscription for $59. You could have a print only subscription for $125, more expensive. Or you could have a print and web option for $125, same as the print only option. Now, at this point, if I was with you in person, I'd get a show of hands which one you would choose. Um, presumably, none of you would choose the print only, because why would you? And indeed, people don't. When Dan asked 100 students at the MIT Sloan School of Management which option they would go for, 84 went for print and web, 16 for web only, none for the print only, as, as expected. But there's an interesting question here. What role is this print only option doing in shaping the decisions that people are making. So he gave a second bunch of students a different choice. And this choice was between the web only option, 59, same price, and the print and web option, 125, same price. The only difference, there's no, there's no print only option anymore, it's gone. So you can probably imagine uh, what happens here. And what happens is now, 68 people choose the web only option instead of 16 and 32 chose the print and web down from 84. So what do we learn from this? Well, we learn that the marketing people at The Economist are pretty smart. They have lured people to choosing the more expensive print and web option by including another option as a kind of psychological anchor. So what's going on here is this is an example of economic relativity. You know, the only option that was removed was an option that nobody chose anyway. It's kind of fascinating. But the decisions we make are not pure readouts of some objective cost benefit value. The decisions we make are made in context. They're inferences that are based on the context, the context provided in this case by the other options. And what I want to, uh, the reason I'm using this example is not to just go into this cognitive, this specific cognitive bias. I mean, we can do that later on. There's lots written on these sorts of cognitive uh, and behavioral biases. But it's because this example of economic relativity is, I think, one manifestation of something much more general, 
in how the brain makes sense of the data that it gets. And it's where it's that generality that I think is relevant and interesting. So here's an example of what I would call perceptual relativity. So here, I want you to just have a look at these, this image and hopefully to you, the uh, orange disc on the right surrounded by the smaller circles should look larger than the orange disc on the left. Um, but this is, this is how things seem, but this is not how they are. And people who were here last year will probably remember me saying that quite a lot. Things are not as they seem. In fact, they're of course exactly the same size and I can demonstrate that if I just put a, a little ring around it and, and move it across. It's the same size, but they look different. The perception of the size of the disc is not a direct readout of the size of the disc. It's an inference based on context and the context is now provided by the other discs. Uh, actually, this is a much more powerful version of this illusion that I can't resist showing you here. I want you to focus, I think you can see on the on the kind of bluish disc in the upper left, if it's mirrored the right way, there's a, a little blue dot. I want you to focus your attention on the little blue dot and then just see if you can judge what happens to the orange disc now. Keep looking at the blue disc, whoop, gets bigger, gets smaller. If you're like me, the orange disc seems to be getting smaller, getting bigger, getting smaller but it's not changing, of course. And I can show this if I put these little guardrails up and you can see that the orange disc, not changing size at all, even though it really seems to be, this is called the dynamic Ebbinghaus uh, illusion. And the point of this is that it's the same process, I think, that underlies this kind of perceptual relativity that underlies how we make the decisions we make. And it, it's more than, in fact, it goes further. So this common principle applies to perception, to decision-making, but also to the very experience of making a decision, to free will itself. You know, we are not as rational as we may think we are. And the experience of making a decision, the experience of exercising your free will is also not what it seems. And to make that point, to get there, to try and persuade you that that's the case, I need to tell you a little bit more about how the brain achieves this process of perceptual best guessing. And some of the next three, four or five minutes may be familiar to those who were around last year, but hang on because I'm gonna go somewhere very new with all this soon enough. The idea is that the brain is a prediction machine and that what you see and hear and feel are nothing more than your brain's best guesses about the causes of sensory input. So imagine for a second that you are a brain. There you are, you're stuck inside this bony skull trying to figure out what's out there in the world. And there's no light in the skull and there's no sound. All you have to go on as a brain are these streams of electrical signals which are only indirectly related to things in the world, whatever they are. And these signals, they don't come with labels like I'm from, the, I'm from a cat or a coffee cup or I'm from the eyes or from the ears. They're just electrical signals. So perception is not this process of reading out sensory data. It's a process of informed guesswork in which these ambiguous sensory signals are combined by prior expectations or beliefs about the way the world is to form the brain's best guess of the causes of these sensory signals. So the brain doesn't hear sound. The brain doesn't see light. What we perceive is the brain's best guess of what's out there. And this is a very different way of thinking about perception. It's got an old history, of course, but it's kind of counterintuitive. It's intuitive to think that perception is this reading out of sensory data. Sensory signals flow from the brain into the world and the eyes are transparent windows for the brain onto an objective reality. But instead of that, instead of perception being this process of readout, it depends much more on perceptual predictions which flow in the opposite direction from the inside out, the top down. We don't passively perceive our worlds, we actively generate them. And the whole process of perception can be thought of as these top down predictions, that's what we perceive being constantly updated by prediction errors. Like the brain is continually testing hypotheses about the way the world and the body is and updating these predictions based on the sensory signals that it gets. One more example, again, if you, you may have seen this last year, but I think it puts it very powerfully. 
about how perception is, is really based on this process of prior expectation. So in this, this is called Adelson's checkerboard. If you see the two patches A and B, uh, the little letters there, I'll put, I'll put some arrows so you can see them. Those two gray patches look, I hope, to be very different shades of gray, one lighter than the other. But they are, of course, exactly the same shade of gray, just as the disks were exactly the same size. And I can show you that if I join the two patches up in the second image, A and B, and you can see it's one continuous shade of gray. If I move this bar across, it becomes even clearer because I'm now joining those two patches that you saw before, same color gray, take it away and they look different again. And what's going on here is that the brain is using its prior knowledge that you're not even aware of having built deep into the circuits of your visual cortex that objects under shadow appear darker than they are. And so we perceive the patch B as being lighter than it really is. And the kind of take home message from last year that I just want to rehearse is that this means, you know, we're used to saying, I'll believe it when I see it as some sort of ground truth, but it's I think more true to say that I'll see it when I believe it. You know, from beliefs about shadows to beliefs about faces to beliefs that we gain from our social and cultural environments, our perceptions are always influenced and built from the beliefs that our brain has about the world in which it exists. Now, the second important thing as we go towards de decision and volition is that this principle applies not only to the world, but also to the self. It's tempting to think that the self is the thing that does the perceiving, that takes in these senses, forms perceptions of the world. But the self is also a perception. It's also a prediction that's updated by sensory data. Just the same principle is applying. The experience of being you or being me is a set of perceptual predictions about the causes of sensory signals that come from, in this case, the body. Same dance of prediction and prediction error. One short example of this that you may remember is the rubber hand illusion. And in a rubber hand illusion, a person's rubber real hand is hidden from sight, one side of that partition, and a fake hand is placed in front of them. The real hand and the rubber hand are simultaneously stroked um, by the second person with a green shirt while the person stares at the fake hand. And what happens here, which is fascinating, is that the... Uh, <laughs> I mean, however many times I watched that, it's still funny. The, the guy in blue begins to assimilate the fake hand as part of his body. Not entirely, but it's this uncanny feeling that it's both somewhat and not part of his body. And the idea is that you know, there's enough evidence for the brain to make its inference, its best guess, that the what is the body has now changed and it incorporates this fake hand. Now, actually, the story is much more complicated than that. I don't want to go into it here. I just mentioned that we've been doing a lot of work on this last year. And it turns out in neuroscience that the rubber hand illusion is a very ferocious, uh, ferociously debated subject. And we've got into uh, quite a lot of ruckus in the field by pointing out that the rubber hand illusion is not as simple as people think it is. Um, for instance, it depends on how hypnotically suggestible you are. But in any case, the experience demonstrates that what we experience as being the self is a kind of perception. And now I want to apply this idea to decision-making and voluntary action, how we make the choices that we make. Again, there's a, a simple um, intuition here, which is that the decisions that you make emerge from the exercise of your own free will. And I want to want to try one last experiment with you here now. And again, I can't see anybody, unfortunately, but I'd like you to hold your left hand in front of you and then at a time of your own choosing, just clench your fist like that, whenever you feel like it. And if you were like me, you've, maybe you felt something like a conscious urge to make that action. And it's tempting to think that this conscious urge caused the action, that there's some kind of free will pulling the strings inside your body and your brain that is causing you to make your decisions. And that this free will is kind of fundamental to who you are. And this is a classic notion of the human mind, tracing back at least to Descartes, that there's this immaterial and completely rational entity that is driving or piloting the brain and the body. 
And this may be what things sometimes seem like. That you, you're in your brain, you're exercising rational consideration, and then this exercise of free will causes something to happen. But how things seem is not how they are. What I want to persuade you is that this experience of free will is just another kind of perception. Now, Benjamin Libet was a neuroscientist who in the 1980s conducted a series of experiments about all this that have remained highly controversial and, and hotly debated. And he had a, people do a version of the experiment that you yourselves just did. He had them repeatedly, voluntarily clench, clench their fist at a time of their own choosing. And what, <clears throat> excuse me, while they were doing that, he measured three things. He measured the time of their actual, when their wrist moved using electromyography, uh, measures muscle activity. He measured the brain activity both before and after the movement, but critically, he also asked people to watch a revolving dot on an oscilloscope screen and to remember where the dot was when they felt this conscious urge to move their wrist. In this way, he was able to measure the timing of the experience of free will. And then he compared the timings of these three things. And that's what you see below. Now, it turns out that the experience of free will comes before the actual movement. This, this graph below is time locked to the timing of the movement itself. That's the origin there. So A is when you experience the urge to move and it comes before the action. But there's this earlier buildup of electrical activity, which has been called the readiness potential which happens before both the action and also before people were aware of their intention to move their wrist. This is a bit weird. It seems as though the brain is gearing up for a voluntary action before the person was even aware that they were going to do something. Very strange. This is actually um, what a, a real redness potential looks like if you, if you measure it using electroencephalography, which just measures electrical brain activity. Now, this is strange because the natural way to think about this kind of situation is that the conscious urge to move causes the movement. That's what free will feels like. Just the same way that's what it seems like when the patches of gray seem to be different shades of gray. But the redness potential, the signal in the brain seems to come before both. So does it cause both? And if it does, what place could there be for free will? You know, perhaps this completely just disproves that you know, rules out the possibility of free will. In fact, Benjamin Libet himself was worried about this and he thought that, okay, if there's no free will, maybe there's still free won't, which is the idea that consciousness may not start voluntary actions, but it might be able to call them off at the last minute. It's a bit of a strange idea. But what I wanna persuade you is that the experience of volition makes sense as a, if you think of it as a special kind of perception, the experience of free will of making a decision doesn't cause the voluntary action. It's a way of perceiving that action. And to explain that, just think what a voluntary action feels like from the inside. Here's an example that works for me. I'm Just before giving this talk, I went to the kitchen and made myself a cup of tea. This is a classic example of a voluntary decision and a set of voluntary actions. And the experience of doing this has a number of features which are common to all voluntary decisions. There's a feeling that it's aligned with my beliefs and values and goals. I'm, I'm English, so tea is extremely valuable to me and I believe that I will enjoy tea. So I frequently have the goal of tea. But note that I can't choose these beliefs, values and goals. I just have them. I can choose what to do, but I can't choose my values and beliefs and goals, at least not so easily. Arthur Schopenhauer, the philosopher, said this very nicely. He said, man can do what he wills, but he cannot will what he wills. The second feature of what voluntary decisions feel like is that the feeling that I could have done otherwise. You know, I went to the kitchen, I made tea, but I could have made coffee. Coffee was there, so I could have made coffee, but I didn't want coffee. I wanted tea, so I made tea. But there was this distinct feeling, as there often is, that other things could have been done by me. And finally, there's the feeling of actions being caused from within. Nobody forced me to make tea. It wasn't, I wasn't hypnotized to do it. Nobody was holding a gun to my head. The, there was this feeling that the action started 
within me somehow rather than being imposed from outside. The opposite situation would be putting your hand on a nail and you reflexively withdraw it. And there's a very interesting middle ground we'll come back to, which is if you're following orders or instructions or a strict procedure where you're making your own actions, but your flexibility is much reduced by the context in which you're in. Now, it turns out that these properties of how making decisions feel, they map pretty well onto what we know about what happens in the brain when we make a voluntary decision. The British neuroscientist Patrick Haggard has uh, come up with a, a very nice model of this. I, I don't need you to read the, the small text there. It's not really that important. There are just three stages he identifies to decision making, a what stage, a when stage, and a weather stage. The what stage is goal definition. What is it that I'm going to do? next make tea make coffee neither the when stage is the timing of the voluntary action that maps onto this conscious urge that we all felt when we clenched our fists and then there's a final weather stage a sort of late predictive check uh, a last call a potential moment of veto before you make the action those are the three stages and they map onto different parts of the brain. And I, this is no time to uh, go into a lot of neuroanatomy here, but broadly speaking, the what stage, goal selection stage, happens in the frontal parts of the brain, what we call the prefrontal cortex. Um, and then uh, the when stage, the timing of voluntary action, is, is generated, is controlled by areas called the pre-supplementary motor area and areas that have to do with motor control. And the same for the weather stage. Uh, but what's important here is that this, this is just a loop, a never-ending loop. So areas very deep within the brain called the basal ganglia and some, and some other areas, like the nucleus accumbens and other weird and wonderful names, they send activity back up to the prefrontal cortex to help select the next goal. And so it goes round and round and round. And what this network is doing is it's funneling a large array of potential causes into a single flow of voluntary actions. There's nowhere in this loop or no need for some immaterial free will to come in and make things happen that wouldn't otherwise happen. Making a cup of tea is actually a complicated thing to do. So this brings us to what this experience of free will is about. The experience of free will is nothing more than the perception of the looping operation of this network. When we have an experience of free will, it's that we're, we're perceiving that this is the kind of thing that the brain is doing. It's funneling a lot of causes into a single flow of voluntary actions. This means that experiences of free will do not actually cause things to happen. Experiences of free will are perceptions of the causes of voluntary actions. So they're just perceptions, but they have a different kind of flavor, a different kind of character. I mean, the content of a visual experience might be a color like red. The content of a experience of decision making is something like I caused this to happen, I caused something to happen, I caused A to happen rather than B. And just as red doesn't really exist in the in the universe, you know, red and all colors as you know, the painter Paul Cezanne beautifully described it, color is the place where the brain and the universe meet. Free will doesn't exist either. Free will is an inference that the brain makes about the causes of certain actions. If we go back to this readiness potential now, this is what you see in the brain in the run-up to a simple voluntary action, like lifting a finger or clenching a wrist. If you compare that to the kind of brain activity you see when people make a perceptual decision, in this case, judging whether the dots are going more to the left or to the right, and you time lock the activity to when they make the decision, you actually see a very similar thing. And this has been pointed out now by a few people over the last years. Um, you see this ramping up of activity to the voluntary action. You see a similar ramping up of activity to making a perceptual decision. In both cases, the brain is accumulating evidence to make a perception. In one case, that an action was voluntary. In another case, that the dots are moving one way or the other way. Same thing going on. Now, if volition is a perception, then it can also be subject to misperception. Just as we have visual illusions of the sort I showed earlier, we can have illusions of volition too. Now, the example of subscribing to The Economist was one sort of illusion of rationality 
But we can go even deeper into illusions of free will in a way. And this, my favorite example of this is called uh, choice blindness. And this was uh, an experiment done by the Swedish psychologist Peter Johansson about 15 years ago. And it's quite an old experiment, but it's still, still a good one. And in this experiment, he presented students, usually I think male students, repeatedly with pairs of fa female faces. And he asked them to pick the face that they found the most attractive. I mean, there's, ethics had, were easier even 15 years ago to do experiments like this. Um, so he asked the male student, pick the face that you find the most appealing, and they did. And then he would ask them to explain why, and they gave some reasons. But the trick was the uh, experimenter was actually a magician who was skilled at sleight of hand. And on about 20%, if I remember, of trials, he would swap the faces. And he would present to the participant the face that they did not, in fact, choose. And there are two remarkable things that happen. The first is they don't notice. Very few people notice that they've been given the face they didn't choose. And the second thing is, I think more remarkably, they would then go on to justify why they chose the face that they did not, in fact, choose. They would say something like, I thought she had more personality, she was more appealing. So this is a real example of an illusion of, of free will, if you like. People, the brain is retrospectively inferring that they made a choice it didn't, in fact, make. Now, in my lab, we're doing some other stuff a little bit along the same lines. Um, we're using virtual reality and augmented reality uh, to investigate another phenomenon that's related to volition and free will, which is called intentional binding. And this is the well-known phenomenon that if you, if you make an action of your own volition and there's an effect, like let's say you push a button and a light comes on, then you'll perceive the timing of your action and the light to be closer together. They're bound together in time by your intention, by your volition, uh, compared to judging the times of these things separately. It's a sort of signature of, 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 of voluntary action. And what we did was we used this augmented reality setup so that people had virtual hands and that they could push a button indeed. Um, and there was, a, there was a, some, a tone sounded. And in one condition, when they moved their real hand, the virtual hand moved. But in another condition, they didn't move their hand, but the virtual hand moved and pushed the button anyway. So they didn't make a voluntary action but we saw the same amount of intentional binding going on in the two cases. And I, this is sort of a little bit into the weeds, but I just mention it because I, I find it, you know, it's, it's actually just an interesting example of how we can use technologies like virtual reality to do experiments that would be impossible otherwise. And what it does show here is that you know, the brain again is, is treating an action that wasn't voluntary because it wasn't made, essentially as a voluntary action because it's binding the events together in time in the same way. So the brain can be fooled into figuring out what was voluntary and what was not. Now, this, all this raises a question, and this is, I'm getting to the end now, but the question is kind of where I wanted to end up. If experiences of free will do not cause things to happen, well, what's the point? What are they for? Well, experiences of volition, when we experience an action as freely willed, it's a good way for the brain to keep track of those actions that are caused largely from uh, within and to keep track of the consequences of those actions and to learn from them. So free will is for the future. It's for learning about the consequences of actions that are caused mainly from within. The utility of feeling I could have done otherwise is that next time you might. When you feel in making a voluntary action that I could have made coffee, doesn't mean you actually could have made coffee. Given the state of your brain at that time, you were going to make tea. The making of tea was always going to happen. But next time, your brain will be in a different state. Everything will be subtly different. Perhaps next time, you could finally realize that the stupid English habit of drinking tea is ridiculous. Finally make tea. So here's the sort of provocation. And this is something that I've come to to argue it's not that widespread view actually when we think about free will but i think experiences of free will help us learn and so let's finish by back to this kind of conversation that people have in a pub is free will an illusion well 
a lot of people write books saying that it is. This is a very influential book by Daniel Wegner, The Illusion of Conscious Will. And in some sense, he's right. There is no spooky, soul-powered, uncaused cause that makes things happen that otherwise wouldn't happen. There's no Cartesian residue of immaterial rationality that pulls strings in the brain. That kind of free will doesn't exist, but we don't need it because there is another kind of free will that is completely real. The ability to perform voluntary actions and learn from their outcomes is very real indeed. So long as we have undamaged brains and relatively normal upbringings, each of us has a real capacity to execute and inhibit voluntary actions. And this is a, a free will that's both a freedom from and a freedom to. It's a freedom from immediate causes in the world, whether they're things like nails that you stick your hand onto or people forcing you to do things at gunpoint. But it's not a freedom from the laws of nature, as often people think free will is. And it's a freedom to act according to our beliefs, values, and desires to do as we wish to do. And the fact that this kind of volition is real is highlighted by the fact that it can go wrong it can be injured um, this is one there's a psychiatric syndrome called alien hand syndrome where people make complex voluntary actions they don't experience as being voluntary this is a still from a brilliant dr strangelove film with peter sellers a slightly more tragic example of free will being injured um, came from charles whitman charles whitman was an engineering student who in august 1966 climbed the water tower at Texas University, shot dozens of people, killing 15. He was shot by the police and he'd asked for an autopsy. And in a note he left, he'd asked for an autopsy because he hadn't felt quite right lately. And it turned out that he had this brain tumor that was pressing on his amygdala, which is part of the brain that is implicated in generating fear responses. And it seems reasonable that Unless he'd had that brain tumor, Whitman would not have become America's first mass school shooter. His ability to make decisions according to his beliefs, values, and goals was injured by his brain tumor. And this leads to an interesting question, sort of a slight sidebar to end on, but how do we assign credit and how do we assign blame, responsibility and reward? Well, in Western law, we assign blame based not only on a guilty action, but also on a guilty mind called mens rea in the Latin. And it seems wrong to blame Charles Whitman because did he have a guilty mind or did he just have a brain tumor? But of course, in the end, as we understand more about the brain, it's kind of brain tumors all the way down for all of us. You know, we don't choose to have the brains we have just as we don't choose our parents or the place or time of our birth. So how can we actually be held responsible? Now, reassure you, I don't go all the way with this. I think we can be responsible for our actions, but it becomes a very sort of finesse discussion here. Einstein actually certainly thought along these lines in a 1929 interview with the Saturday Evening Post. He said, because he doesn't believe in free will, he can't take credit for anything. And I'm delighted that this is the second time already today that we've seen um, Einstein crop up. It's another lovely quote from the last presentation. So finish with a couple of implications for this. When we think about making decisions, it's not all about rationality. Making decisions is not about a rational mind pulling strings in the brain and the body. Every decision is a voluntary action and every voluntary action is a kind of perception. And every perception is just a best guess about what's going on, not a direct insight into the nature of reality or of rationality. And perceptions, whether they're of the world or of decisions, are open to being biased or inaccurate. And they can be influenced by many sources of data. They can be shaped by, voluntary actions can be shaped by what you intend to do, as you would expect, but also by emotions, long literature showing how we can't make good decisions without emotions. It's not just, it's not that as Descartes thought that the ability to make decisions should be insulated from emotion wherever possible. No, we need emotions to make good decisions. Phineas Gage was a, a railroad worker from about the 19th century who lost the part of his brain that was able to integrate emotional processing with decision making and he made terrible decisions for the rest of his life. Other people shape how we make decisions too. Um, and they shape our experience of volition also. So the one kind of odd example that I like of this is the example of a firing squad. One of the reasons you have a whole bunch of people in the firing squad is that now 
there are many potential causes for the action of shooting the person you have to shoot. And so you experience less volition and agency over the outcome. The experience of making the event happen is diffused across a large number of people here. And there's a group in Belgium now that's doing great work studying how decision-making is shaped in this way by instructions, by authority, simply by other people who could simultaneously be the cause of whatever happens. Of course, this happens in organizations too. If you're in a very hierarchical organization, then you might experience less, your, your decisions, you might experience your actions as less your own. And of course, if you do that, you're gonna not learn from them in the same way. And that brings me to the final point, which is that free will is for the future. And I think this is the best way to think about it. When we experience free will, when we make actions according to our intentions, we learn. The utility of feeling you could have done otherwise is not that you actually could have, but the next time you might. Now, this is not always going to be useful. Sometimes you have to do exactly the same thing. But when flexibility and innovation is needed, it's very useful indeed to learn. So, summary. Spooky free will of this sort of immaterial stuff doesn't exist. But voluntary actions are real. Experiences of free will do not cause voluntary actions. They are perceptions of the causes of these actions. And they are essential for learning so that we might do better the next time. And what this means to me when we think about organizations and management and so on, means that cultivating people's experiences of intention and agency over their actions, cultivating their experience of being in control of what they do, there's good reason to understand that that helps them to learn to do better when what they're doing requires flexibility and innovation. If they don't experience an action as voluntary, they won't learn from it in the same way. So that was the conclusion I wanted to hit. I just wanted to mention other stuff that you know, we can discuss. I am, we're working on a lab that's relevant to all this. We're looking at how confidence and self-efficacy uh, affect decision-making, self-efficacy being this sort of, how, how strongly do you believe you're good at something and how much does that affect what you do? Uh, we're looking at, active machine learning, how to design machines to choose the data they learn from. And we're also looking, I think it's slightly tangential to all this, but time perception. How do we experience the duration and the flow of time? And I think this is kind of important for how we you know, perform tasks too. But can't talk about those today. I want to stop there and leave you just with a brief advert for this. My book on consciousness, neuroscience and self is coming out September next year. Um, there's a bunch of other talks and things and books. Uh, but thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you again. Thank you so much, Anil. Um, we have time for a few audience questions and um, Gary Fisher will be joining us as well. He has some questions of his own. So let me just ask Gary to join. There okay. we go. So you got me thinking, I, very provocative as usual. So you got me thinking here, and I ended my remarks with, you have a choice to make, which dovetails very nicely into what you just talked about. So help me understand why someone would choose to continue doing what they know, what they know how to do, even though really they know it won't work. Yeah. It's a really, yeah, it's a good question. And I think here we're getting into not so much the experience of free will, but more these kind of cognitive biases that it's a bit more similar to the example of the economist subscription thing. There's a couple of things that come to mind. What One is um, there are two very well-known cognitive biases that, that play into this, at least. One of them is, the, is, is, the, is loss aversion. And this has been known for a very long time, the economist Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky pioneered research into this. Most people are, if you, most people would prefer value gaining something about half as much as they fear losing the same amount. Put it, put it another way, people would much rather, to make a gamble of when you might earn, um, $10, you only need, people will only be willing to risk $5 for the same odds. 
Mm-hmm. And we tend to do this all the time. And, and you, can pre- you, can, you can frame a choice. If you frame a cho- choice where there's a potential gain, it's valued less than if you, f- if you frame it as a potential loss. And if you continue doing the same thing, there's a sort of prior that you're, you can't really lose because you're doing the same thing. So what that suggests to me is that to make people change, the perceived gain from that change has to be much more than it objectively is in order to outweigh the potential loss of, of changing. And, and the, other, the other heuristic that comes to mind is something called the availability heuristic. And when we judge the sort of likelihood of an outcome or, or the significance of an outcome, this is strongly related to our ability to generate examples of that outcome. So for instance, if I, you know, if I ask you to you know, think, are there more words in the English language that begin with the letter K or that have the letter K coming third? Most people will say there's more that begin with K, but there aren't. The reason people think that is because it's easier to generate examples of, letter, of words that have a starting letter than think, you know, where does, what words have it as the third letter? Mm-hmm. Um, and this, you know, this affects all kinds of things like we're seeing now. Any adverse event to vaccines, people will then dramatically overestimate the likelihood or the risk associated with, with taking a vaccine because they can bring to mind these episodes. And so if you're thinking of why, why you keep doing the same thing, well, it's because you, um, you've got a lot of experience of doing the same thing. So you're... You know, that's just it just has a much stronger weighting in terms of its relevance and salience than something you haven't done yet. Yeah. Even though the logic of doing it for a loss and knowing that you're going to lose, it's just how bad you're going to lose is the only is the only thing in question versus a potential for a gain that mm-hmm. you're unsure about, I guess. That's absolutely right. And I mean, that's actually the, the I, I forgot, but you're, you're bang on there because if you rely on people to behave rationally, you're going to go wrong. People don't behave rationally. I mean, the whole field of economics was based on this totally wrong idea that we we act as rational agents. The whole field of behavioral economics and neuroeconomics has been challenging that. And Kahneman, again, has this idea of system one versus system two thinking. And system two thinking is supposed to be this, this rational, slow, consciously explicit thinking through things where we follow the logic, you know, you present people with the data and they go, oh yeah, we should change and do it this way because it makes sense. But actually a lot of what we do is not driven by that. It's driven by this unconscious, automatic, instinctual responses, which, which use emotions, but which are guided by these heuristics. And these heuristics often do well, but they're also open to these kinds of biases and those are when these biases are, are at work that we have this departure between you know rational behavior and what people in practice do and anil we have time for one more question um this comes from someone in the audience from exxon mobile and they asked um they said we use lessons learned on projects to teach people you know to learn based on other people's actions and outcomes how can we do this more effectively without everyone having to experience good or bad outcomes, which is very expensive? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's a question definitely that you have to think about um, more. It's it, what comes just off the top of my head, what comes to my mind about this is, is certainly just recognizing that there is that difference is very important. You, unless you put people in a situation where they experience agency over their decisions, that they're, they're just not going to learn in the same way. I mean, this, I guess, is why one of the reasons you train pilots and flight simulators, it's, it's, you, you have to give them agency over, over their actions. So if there's any way in which you can leverage simulation technology, and I saw in one of, one of Gary's slides, this is part of, you know, some part of the circle of, 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 what, of what you do, of how you consider project management, then you can allow people to make decisions, hopefully, that aren't so, aren't so costly. And what's, what's really open here is whether it really works if it's, if it's a simulation decision. But here, I think we can, again, leverage on this kind of system one, system two thing, because rationally, you know it's a simulation, so you know it doesn't really matter. 
but there are other parts of your brain that don't really care. You know, they still experience a simulation as you, know, you still couple actions to outcomes in a way that makes sense for the parts of the, you know, your cognitive architecture that, that expressed themselves in these biases. So it's not going to be the same as learning from you know, actual behavior. But I think there's a productive middle ground to explore there that's much better than just giving case studies from a third person perspective. Absolutely. Thank you. And um, Anil, that's all the time we have for today, unfortunately. But we really want to thank you for sharing your research and your insights with us and just for being with, here with us today. Um, this concludes our introductory session. Uh, we will now end this session and have a brief 15-minute um, break before beginning our two concurrent sessions, which will start at 10 a.m. Central. The first session will focus on how leading companies implement and benefit from project production management using various case examples. The second concurrent track focuses on the digitalization of construction what does it mean and how to do it? And that includes some simulations, Dr. Seth, as you, um, as you discussed. Um, and as a reminder, links to all the sessions throughout the day can be found both in your confirmation email that you should have received. Um, and also the schedule, as I mentioned earlier, is posted on our PPI website that has the various sessions listed along with the links to join. So thank you all for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in our next sessions. And thank you again, Dr. Seth.